Hello, I'm Luke, and today I will be talking about Winfield Scott and why he deserves a monument. But first, to talk about Winfield Scott, we're going to have to go back quite a while. So, in 1786, nothing much was happening. The American Revolution had already been fought. The British were almost already defeated. The only interesting thing that happened that year was the creation of the United States Mint, but that is boring. The only really, really interesting thing that happened that year was Shays Rebellion, but Congress didn't talk about that until 1787, so it does not count. So all in all, pretty boring year. I mean, who would even think that a boy being born in a small town in Virginia could even make a difference? I mean, it's a poor kid who will start from the bottom. How could he make it to the top? How could it happen? Well, the odds were very much in the favor of one Winfield Scott. At the beginning of his life, as previously discussed, he had it pretty rough. Quote, he was one of four children, and although his father died when he was young, his mother provided for his education. Orphaned at age 17, he was well equipped by then to set out on his own. Scott initially pursued law as a career, studying at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, before apprenticing to a lawyer in nearby Petersburg. In 1807, in Richmond, Scott witnessed the former U.S. Vice President, Aaron Burr, stand trial and be acquitted for treason because he shot Alexander Hamilton." Unquote. As you can clearly see, though he had a fair share of hardships, he always wanted to improve himself and learn what it meant to have true justice, and after being a lawyer didn't work out when his firm failed, he learned well through his hardships to dust himself off and get back up. He decided that he would find a new career by joining the military so he can protect the country he loves. Quote, His military career began in May 1808, shortly before his 22nd birthday, when he was appointed a captain in the U.S. Light Artillery. Early in his career, Scott openly criticized the commanding general of the army, James Wilkinson, earning him a court-martial for insubordination in 1810 and a suspension of his commission for one year." Unquote. Even when he was young, he always had the determination to stand up for what he believed in and stand against corruption. He even said later in life, quote, my politics are of a practical kind. The integrity of the country, the supremacy of the federal government, and honorable peace, or none at all." Unquote. When his career really kicked off, he joined the War of 1812 as a lieutenant colonel. However, that didn't go quite as well because he then got captured while trying to capture a British fort, a reverse capture. But, however, he spent the time in jail before he was exchanged out to learn from his mistakes and perfect his strategies. Once he was out of jail, he was promoted to colonel and then led a charge against another British position, Fort George. He led the charge and had an intense battle, suffering a wound in the process, but nevertheless, he pressed on and led a major victory that promoted him to Brigadier General, all at the age of 27. What were you doing at the age of 27? Anyway, he really, really liked the class and style of the military, and that gave him a nickname he would be remembered for for the rest of his life. Quote, At this time, Scott earned his nickname Old Fuss and Feathers for his insistence on military discipline and appearance, which, even though it rankled his mostly volunteer soldiers, helped them turn into a crack fighting force." Unquote. 
He later used said crack fighting force to win the Battle of Chippewa in Ontario, Canada during the War of 1812. However, in a later battle, the Battle of Lundy Lane, he got severely wounded in his left shoulder, but his actions got him promoted to Major General, so it was worth it. And he also got a gold medal for all his good actions in the War of 1812. I mean, shot to the shoulder for a gold medal and a promotion? I mean, worth it? After all these conflicts and damages Winfield Scott had suffered, you'd think he'd take a break. And you'd be wrong, fool. His country needed him, and he decided that he would join the Mexican War. Quote, Insistent that he personally command the force, Scott managed to co-opt much of Taylor's army, making Scott's the largest American army to that point ever assembled. With it, he captured Veracruz in March 1847. Setting off for the Mexican interior, Scott spent a year fighting and marching before reaching the outskirts of the Mexican capital, unquote. While he was heading for the Mexican capital, however, his supply lines were cut and his situation hopeless. But then Winfield Scott remembered he was Winfield Scott, so he lived off the land, which was a very dangerous idea at the time. And he took the entirety of Mexico City like the true Giga Chad he was. However, he had to deal with an absolute idiot of a general, William S. Harney. Remember him for later. After the war, about seven years later, he got a special promotion for being such an awesome leader. Quote, on March 7th, 1855, Scott was promoted to Brevet Lieutenant General, a rank not held by anyone since George Washington, unquote. After all these combat situations and awards Winfield Scott had achieved, you'd think he'd be out of the woods for a bit, but the next conflict he'd have to deal with, it'll take a bit of context. So, when America and Canada were making the border, they had a straight line across the 49th parallel, I believe, but it did not extend to a few islands between a Canadian peninsula and Washington State, and no one knew who these islands belonged to. So when a bunch of American and British farmers were over there, tensions were escalating higher and higher until an American farmer shot a British pig, and tensions escalated like crazy. And William S. Harney, the guy from earlier, was sent over there to fix the problem. However, he was very incompetent or he just wanted to be a war hero. We don't know, he was that stupid. Anyway, he escalated the situation a lot, and that made it really hard. So, General Scott had to go all the way up there to fix his problems, but he was racked with gout at the time, and gout is very painful, I'm told. But he still powered through. He took an agonizing six-week trip over to the islands so he could use his masterful negotiation skills to defuse the situation. Quote, Scott proposed a joint military occupation until a final settlement could be reached, which both nations approved in November. Harney was officially rebuked and eventually reassigned for allowing the situation to needlessly escalate. Unquote. The islands were eventually given over to the Americans after their presentation to the German ambassador, who was deciding who would get the islands, had a little more quote-unquote pizzazz. Anyway, back to General Scott. He just got finished with an agonizing six-week trip to and back, not including the back one. And you'd think he'd be out of the woods for a bit again, but... No, because his country just got into the Civil War. When the Civil War started, General Scott looked at his anti-slavery views and thought, oh yeah, I don't like slavery. I'm gonna go side with the Union. But 
Him siding with the Union lost him men, but he still did not let him get that down. In fact, he came up with a plan to cut off supply lines for the South, known today as Scott's Great Snake. Quote, it is sometimes called the Anaconda Plan. This map, somewhat humorously, depicts Winfield Scott's Anaconda Plan, which resulted in an overall blockade, beginning in 1862, of southern ports and not only targeted the major points of entry for a slave slash slave trade, but also crippled cotton exports, unquote. This plan actually did work quite a bit, as one of the South's main exports were cotton to England. Excuse me. And cutting off their supply of cotton would damage their funds, and no funds means no soldiers. No soldiers means no war. However, the sheer amount of battles and negotiations that Winfield Scott had to deal with definitely took a toll on him. But he also definitely left a mark on his country when he had to retire in May of 1861. Quote, when he retired from the army in November 1861, Scott had been a general longer than his successor, George McKellen, had been alive. He lived to see the Union win the war, dying at West Point on May 29, 1866, at age 79. His military career spanned 30, no, not 30, 53 years, 47 of which were as a general, and he went through three major wars. Unquote. General Scott left an amazing legacy of protecting his country and leading his men, and thus, he deserves a monument. This is a model of the monument I have created. It would be located in a park in Dinwiddle County, Virginia, which is Winfield Scott's birthplace, and in the center of the park would be a big statue of General Scott in his classy military uniform. I included this type of coloring here because that was the closest I could get to a military uniform at the time with the Legos I had. I included this sword, this golden sword right here, because whenever I look at a photo or a painting of Winfield Scott I find on the internet, he always has this golden sword by his side. And last but not least, I have this pipe cleaner snake right here, which represents his anaconda plan. And though he could not directly be in the Civil War, he definitely fought in it. There's a more top-down view. This part right here is kind of a parking lot area. At the bottom, you can see a little plaque thing. On the plaque is a quote from General Scott himself. Quote, the enemy say that Americans are good at long shot, but cannot stand the cold iron. I call upon you instantly to give a lie to this slander. Charge! Unquote. This quote I have specifically chosen for the courage that he gave in battle along with the leadership he was known for. This monument that I have devised represents how each American citizen can protect what they believe in, and through hard work and facing adversity, they can accomplish great things. Though General Scott might be slandered for being less of a leader in his later life because of all the tolls that battle has taken on him, I believe that he was a great man that fought for his country and loved it enough to give his life to it. And I believe that that man deserves recognition for what he has done for this country. Thank you, and good night.
Go!